Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the talk, which is going to be about transforming legacy PHP applications in Symfony and Varnish. Um, my name is Craig Marvelli. I'm a software developer at a company called Box UK. I work in Cardiff, and we are technical partners with a company called Careers Wales, uh, which are an organisation that aims to get people in Wales into employment, um, right from start from school, where uh, kids can manage the, set of the lessons that they enrol in, in GCSE and A-level, right through university and into adult employment and finding jobs there. Um, it's, a, it's a big organisation responsible for a lot of employment in Wales, so it's a, quite a, a high traffic website. It looks a little bit like this. Um, it's, a, it's a CMS based website. Um, we built a CMS for them. Uh, well, the, the origins of the CMS started around 2000, 2001. Uh, and it gradually got, uh, got refactored, but the version they're running on was built around about 2006, so it's seven, eight years old. Um, PHP 4 based, um, worked quite well, but originally it was built as a CMS for a website, and as, as, the, as the website grew and grew, uh, it became a lot more things. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, with feature creep and how that can happen. And what started off as a really simple website evolved into this application with mapping and API lookups and, uh, and all sorts of really fancy sort of things that the original platform wasn't designed for. Um, and we reached a point where um, we couldn't really go any further with the current, with the current solution. And this is the case in July 2012. Um, got a graph here, um, hopefully try and illustrate what's going on. This is a load test read against the current website, uh, as it was back in July 2012. Um, and this simulated uh, how 10 users would hit the home page log in as a verified user, and then navigate to a page, just display some dynamic, uh, dynamic information available only to them. And by the time we'd ramped up to 10 concurrent users, so 10 users hitting the website exactly at the same time, we were looking at about 20 seconds average, uh, average run to, to do those three things, hit the homepage, log in, and access some dynamic information. So that's a hell of a long time, and as many people are aware of, um, that sort of time frame is going to turn people off from using websites um, so we were, we were under a lot of pressure to try and improve this. Um, to make this even more complicated, because Careers Wales are a, a body that work with schools and educational establishments, um, we see a lot of peaks in traffic, uh, around this time of year now when kids are going back to school, starting to look at their options um, and use a lot of the features of the site. We see, we see a lot of traffic, um, which obviously tails off during the summer when children aren't in school. So we have to be able to handle peaks in traffic um, and be able to scale that automatically. So what we tried to do is first of all move to EC2 um, so we could automatically scale the servers that we were using, which improved things slightly, but it was still slow. And that was for these reasons. Firstly, we were using PHP 4, um, obviously well past its sell-by date. Um, I, I don't know of many projects that have started recently that use PHP 4. So we, we were aware that we were sort of come to the end of how long we could feasibly maintain a PHP 4 code base. The, the back end for the site was using SQL Server. Um, that's because historically uh, the, the organization always used SQL Server, and they have other organizations that also access their data in SQL Server. But because we were using that, um, and because PHP 4 um, and SQL Server, um, it was so hard to communicate, unless we used Windows Server, it meant we were also using Windows as a platform and IIS. And PHP 4, IIS, Windows, and SQL Server does not add up to a really quick framework, a uh, really quick stack. So that was, that was hindering us. And finally, we had a, a sub-optimal caching strategy. Um, the, the basic ca caching approach was that we'd take the, the response that came back and we'd, we'd, we'd hash it. Um, and then we'd, if, we, if we found a matching hash for that on a subsequent request, we'd return it. But it only ever worked for a single response. And if the response um, contained any dynamic data that was specific to a user, then we couldn't cache anything because we, didn't want to, we wanted to make sure they didn't ever return information to users that wasn't specific to them. We didn't want to share user details around. So the caching strategy wasn't as evolved and as, 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 a, as clever as it could be. This was kind of what we had. This is our, this our, this a really simple server diagram. Basically, a shed load of servers, and that was it. If, if demand went up, if, if we needed to serve more requests, we just threw more servers at it. And these are, these are Windows servers. They're not, expensive on e they're not inexpensive on EC2, and they're, they're quite high. And, uh, they're quite, I think they're... they're uh, medium or large instances, so can be quite expensive at times of peak load. Um, we needed to change this around, and we were mindful that we couldn't start from scratch. This is a really famous quote from an article by Joel Swilsky, where he said, rewriting the code from scratch 
is the single worst strategic, make, strategic decision a company can make. And he was referencing Netscape when they uh, went from Netscape 4 to Netscape 6, and they, down, they, they, they pretty much abandoned everything for like three years while they rebuilt the new version. And by the time they eventually got it out, IE was so far ahead they couldn't recover. Um, so we were aware that we couldn't just sort of start again from the scratch um, and, and just work towards a new version at some point in the future, because if we did, we'd end up in this sort of situation where it was all fine at the start, but the closer and closer we got to the end, the more scared we got, and then by the time it came to go live, we knew it was all going to go horribly wrong, and you're lying on the kitchen floor covered in your own vomit. Um, that was essentially what we were facing if we just tried a new thing from scratch. Um, additionally, we knew that we couldn't just hack things around and just to incrementally improve performance by small degrees. Um, this quote, the quick fix is like quicksand, the clarity of code goes down and confusion is harvested in its place, is a counterpoint to the start from scratch approach. Um, and I found a gift to go with that, which looks something like this, where, it, yeah, it looks good at the start, but then you quickly realize that you're, you're floundering, there's not much you can do about it. Um, incidentally, I'll give you guys a bit of advice. If you are ever tempted to Google for people in quicksand with safe search off, do not, do not do it. NSFW, I'm going to save you that pain. I could have got sacked for that. Um, so we knew we couldn't start from scratch. We knew no small fixes were going to improve this. Refactoring the application was an option, but mindful that we're using PHP 4 on a Windows platform, there's always going to be a ceiling to how good we can get that code and how fast we can get that code. And we knew it was unlikely we're ever going to get it fast enough on that stack. So we needed something a bit more um, out of the box to, to, try to, to try and fix this problem. So the plan that we came up with, mindful that our end goal was to reduce costs because we were looking at a lot of servers at the moment just to, just to maintain uh, a, a reasonable level of performance. Um, but we had, to, uh, we had to directly improve performance by a massive amount. Um, we were, so that, that, that thing we were looking at, 20 seconds for that, um, that round trip, we needed to get that down uh, to at least five, four seconds. So we looked at developing a new application framework for this. Um, but the idea was that we didn't want to have the we didn't want to have any, um, we didn't want to make users aware that they were dealing with two different platforms. We had the old code and the new code, and we didn't want them to be, uh, there to be any point where the user had a jarring experience as they switched from one to the other. So we decided to try and enforce a gradual deployment to the careersworlds uh, uh, domain. So even, it didn't matter if you went to careersworlds.com, it didn't matter which website uh, application framework you ended up hitting, to the user it was completely transparent. Um, so to do that, we needed an API in order to access shared data. So um, we'd have two stacks running side by side and an API in the middle to share data between the two. And then uh, a single sign-on solution so the user could sign into this and only sign into what, once into both, into both sides of the application. And then a session to share the user between the two. So like I said, it, it would be, as far as the users were concerned, they wouldn't even know that they were working on two different stacks. So this sort of, this sort of thing, where the careersrails.com domain actually houses two separate application frameworks side by side. One, the legacy CMS, and another one, any number of new applications that we could build. Um, we wanted to tr also try to get away from this big, this big mud of code that, the, that was the current legacy CMS. This is over a million lines of code by now, running a load of different applications. We wanted to try and break that down to a more modular sort of approach with a load of small discrete modular applications doing the independent jobs. And this is where uh, so we brought Symphony 2 into the equation. Um, initially, I was going to call this, this talk Careers Wales, uh, a symphony in four parts, um, which may be funny. I don't know. I'm guessing not. So I probably did the right decision <laughs> not doing that. Um, so it was used successfully in other projects in the company. Um, I think by this point, uh, we do simply put a year, and it had a good track record of the things we tried it with. The, the key thing for us was excellent third-party libraries. We needed a lot of code to, to re-implement. We didn't need to get feature parity with the old CMS, and that's a, that's a tall order for something that's been running for 10 years. So we had a lot of work to do there, and the more third-party code we could lean on that was good and reliable, the better. Um, it had to be flexible and easy to extend, which is something I like Symphony for. The dependency injection container, and the way you can swap things out, modify um, using compiler passes, you can modify the dependency injection service configuration. That, that was awesome because it means that even if we did want to use something by somebody else and didn't quite fit the job, we can make small applications and swap classes in and out as needed. And finally, it facilitates best practice, which is something that we've been pushing for in the last few years in the company, um, you know, trying to enforce people writing unit tests and functional tests. And because it simply makes that easy with the testing tools that it's got, 
um, that, was, that was a really good thing. Um, so I'm just going to run you through a few of the... I, I picked four main sort of areas I want to talk about. And the first one is the CMS that we built. Um, so the previous CMS, so I'm built in PHP 4, as I've been running for 10 years, had a lot of features. Um, we were mindful we needed to keep all that, but we also knew that um, this was the key area where the, the framework had to be fast. Um, it was relatively straightforward to get good performance out of Symfony. If you're just looking at a standard sort of controller action where you just render a view and work some data, that generally performs quite well. But when you're working with a CMS and you're pulling in content um, from, from databases, um, potentially you know, tens, maybe hundreds of content, like, content items on a page, and you're trying to authenticate users and all that sort of stuff, um, it can get quite slow. So we knew that it had to be quite fast. Um, so we decided on a cutting edge stack uh, using PHP uh, 5.4 as it was then. We're looking to move to 5.5 in the near future using Nginx as the web server and FPM, the fork process management, uh, which is pretty much, I think, as fast as you get PHP in terms of the framework at the moment, uh, the stack. We wrote all the CMS code in reusable bundles, um, similar to what Richard was talking about earlier. Uh, we made an effort to make this code uh, reusable so we can use it in other projects elsewhere. So the idea was that even though this CMS would run the careers Rails website, in future we could use it in other projects. And um, Initially, we hoped to use an existing CMS solution. Um, we looked at the Symfony CMF, uh, which unfortunately wasn't quite mature enough at that point. It, it still hasn't gone to 1.0. And we wanted to make sure that you're building on top of a stable platform. We didn't want to have to worry about having to refactor for backwards compatibility breaks during our, our own uh, implementation. We looked at Sonata as well, which is a fantastic solution. Um, we took a lot of inspiration from Sonata. Um, but the problem we had with that was, even though there were a lot of paradigms that mapped between our CMS and Sonata, uh, our client, Careers Wales, were used to the old CMS they had, and they wanted so many of the features carried over that it didn't really make sense to use Sonata because there would have been a few too many things that didn't quite work exactly the same way. So what we did was instead we took some inspiration and some code from them. So we ended up using the router from um, Symfony 2 CMF. We uh, took the block paradigm from Sonata, and we used it as a, a sort of a proof of, con uh, not a proof of concept, a, a guiding light into how you would go about doing a CMS in Symfony 2. Um, and we ended up with a CMS that had a fraction of the code um, that we had previously. You know, we had to implement um, category tagging, taxonomies, um, uh, relationship management, uh, page hierarchies, uh, all typical things to expect in a CMS. And we, we achieved it in something like four to five months. And we ended up with like 10% of the code we had previously. So it was, uh, that, was, that worked out really well. This is just a really quick uh, sort of demo of how the CMS works. Anybody's familiar with sort of, you know, WYSIWYG sort of CMS is it's quite a standard sort of interface. Um, uses um, uh, JavaScript, uh, jQuery, and XJS on the front end uh, with a bit of Bootstrap mixed in. Um, we didn't want to spend too much time in the CM on the CMS. This can undoubtedly be improved um, uh, because our main goal was to drive performance up. Um, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't focus too much on the, on the look and feel of the CMS. We just need to get feature parity, really. Um, but it was, it was really quick to work with, um, so aided by the fact that we had good examples in Sonata to, to follow. Um, but here, a case of adding blocks and adding content to the page, really smooth, really quick. We're making Ajax uh, requests to a Symfony controller in the back end. Um, the, whole MB, the whole Symfony MBC sort of approach made it really easy to do stuff like this. Um, and obviously, being able to sort of classify users with different roles as editors, as, super, as, as admin users, super users, that sort of thing, allowed us to add all this stuff really, really quickly. Um, so that's, that was the CMS. I said that, that took about four or five months to implement. The second thing we needed was an API. Um, because we ended up with two stacks, and one stack had the SQL server as a data store, and that's where all the old data was stored, including the users and the user, and the user data. Um, we had a second stack, then the new stack, uh, which used MySQL as its data store. Uh, this is going on EC2, so we used RDS as the, as the back end. Um, but there was obviously a need to share data between the two. Um, and that, that led to us needing an API in the middle. So what we implemented was a Symfony 2 application that sits in between the old system and the new system and acts as a bridge between those two data stores, between SQL Server and MySQL. Um, uh, worked quite well. Doctrine was great because we, we could automatically sort of map all the old database um, tables and, and create models really quickly. Got us using the old data store really fast. Um, 
we were using uh, a really old uh, sort of uh, data mis abstraction layer before, um, and it was, a, it was a, a massive sort of breath of fresh air to use an, o, uh, an ORM with the old legacy database. One, also, one benefit we also got from this, which we didn't anticipate when we first started doing it, was that we could use the API as a facade. So in the old database, we may have three tables that eventually added up to a single sort of uh, record, um, say a user, a user's employment history, and the jobs they were looking to, to, to work with in the future. We could write a, an API endpoint that sort of brought those tables all together for a single query and returned a single response back. And it, it, that let us clean up a lot of the code that we were working with. Um, one of the reasons people hated working with the old system was that the, because, the, because the system had grown over time with feature creep, um, we never really sat down and properly modeled the, probably sort of the data model. So there were tables with really funny names and there was no consistency. And by putting the API in front of it as a facade, we could, we could change the way the data looked and, and felt really easily and present it in a way that we were, we were happy with using. So that was great. Unfortunately, because Linux and SQL Server, working with SQL Server is still a pain, even though there are now drivers from Microsoft for Red Hat to work with SQL Server, uh, I don't think Doctrine's really got a, a, a really stable, trusted driver for it. Um, and the, 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 the possibilities we looked into, none of them really felt right to us. We ended up sticking with Windows for the, uh, for the, for the stack for the, uh, to run the API applications on, um, which is okay. With, we, we found that with adding Symfony caching, um, I'm sure you've all seen this example of this, but if not, it's in the documentation. It's really simple. You can add, um, you can add caching uh, into Symfony responses quite easily, either using annotations or you know, down, uh, manually through PHP. Um, and then doctoring caching at the database level, so we were, the responses that, that were coming, the, the data that was coming out of doctoring, we were making queries, we could cache that and for a period of minutes if, it, if we knew it wasn't going to change. Um, by implementing that, we managed to get decent, um, decent response times out of the Windows applications. Um, so the API performed reasonably well, better than certainly we hoped initially. Um, this, is the, this is what we ended up with uh, from, the, as from the API standpoint. So we've got, the SQL, we've got SQL Server uh, and API application written in Symfony 2 sitting on top of that. And then we've got um, our new C website application, the CMS, talking to the API to get any uh, legacy data like users. Um, but then we've got MySQL on, on RDS as a, as a data store for the actual CMS content which we were happy with. We were much more accustomed to work with MySQL. We, it's something we use more often than SQL Server, so we sort of got gains there from having a more, something we're more familiar with on the CMS side. And the, and the side benefit of this was that Careers Wales, for the first time, now have the opportunity to open up their data to third parties if they want to. Um, we've already integrated one third party, the Welsh Government, into being able to talk to the Careers Wales website and retrieve user information. And that's something that, because uh, Careers Wales are um, closely linked with the Welsh Government, that's great because it means they can sort of share data and, and sort of plan their roadmaps a lot better. Um, so that was a, an unexpected benefit. Um, the third part was the single sign-on approach. Um, single sign-on was required for two reasons. As I mentioned earlier, firstly because we had two application stacks and we didn't want the user to log in twice to both of them. Also because um, Careers Wales have a number of other third parties that um, need to authenticate themselves against their, their system. At the, uh, at the time that we started the project, they were doing that manually by querying the SQL Server database. And we wanted to get away from that. We wanted to sort of extract that data store so we could change it in the future. We, it meant we couldn't touch those tables because if we did, we'd break untold other applications. So having a single sign-on approach where um, we could effectively write a third party sign-in sign -in, uh, uh, approach was really critical for us. Um, we achieved this um, by using a, uh, pro a protocol called CAS, which stands for Central Authentication Service. Um, that's an approach where you have a single server um, that's, that's your authentication server, and that's the one that will present, for example, a login form to the user to enable to enter their credentials. Um, and rather than the user authenticating on the website, they instead, when they try to access a protected resource that they need to be logged in for, they get redirected to the CAS server instead. The CAS server gives them a login form, they log in, and then the CAS server authenticates them, and if they're valid, it sends them back to the website with a, uh, a service token, which is then stored by the website and used in future requests. Um, it's really elegant. Um, the, the website can then use that. We make a curl request to the CAS server with that service token to actually get the user's credentials and details, and then we can, we can store those locally and use those for a limited time. Um, and then we, the user continues as normal. So 
as far as the user is concerned, they aren't. They, they, they notice some difference. They get redirected to a subdomain like accounts or uh, sign on .com, log in, and they carry on their flow as normal. Um, this was also um, implemented as a Windows application because it had to talk to a SQL Server, so that sits on uh, on a Windows uh, Windows machines alongside the API applications. We found a really good bundle called the B Simple SSO Auth bundle. Um, we've used a few of the bundles. Uh, the bundles by the Beast Simple guys. There's a great soap one as well. Um, and that does all the heavy lifting for us in terms of authentication and the, the CAS protocol work. Um, a lot of that was already done in the bundle. And we made small modifications, like I said earlier. Great about Symphony, you can hook into the DI container and modify things and swap classes out. So in a few cases where some of the, some of the things the bundle was doing we didn't like, we were able to tweak that to get it to do what we wanted to do. Um, one of the key ones, uh, one of the key reasons we need to do that was because um, even though we wanted a single sign-on solution, um, which works fine if you're, um, if you're a third party and you want to reuse somebody's authentication, that's fine. If, you know, if, if somebody else wrote an application to use this authentication system, it'd do the same thing. they potentially go to careerswales.com, get redirected, authenticate, get sent back. The next application they went to, the same thing would happen. They'd go to the website, get sent to um, the CAS server, and then get sent back. But we wanted, because we wanted to keep the two application stacks away, uh, the implementation of that away from these as much as possible, we didn't want them to know that they were getting logged in twice or have to log in twice. So by sharing the session um, between the, the two frameworks, by modify, by uh, configuring, you can configure the session in Symfony, um, so you can share the session between um, all subdomains on that careerswales.com domain. Um, we had some custom hooks in Symfony um, to listen for the user getting logged in, and when they did, we sort of automatically logged them into the other half of the applications as well. So um, just, a good, just a good example of how using the DI container, you can sort of tweak um, a bundle that gets you 90% of the way there to get all the way there. Um, and so this brings us on to the main part of the talk, which is Varnish. Um, so with all that we had before, the CMS, um, we had uh, by this point we had a couple of other applications as well, like, like I was saying, more module applications that were specific for certain jobs. Um, we also had the API application, we had the SSO application. We had all this stuff, and this, this is all sitting behind careerswales.com, the domain. Um, but we, we found that we needed Varnish for a few reasons. Um, if you aren't familiar with Varnish, I, I imagine most people have heard of it. Uh, it's a front-end proxy, or HTTP accelerator. Um, basically, it makes things really fast. There's no other way to describe it, really. Um, when it comes to caching, something like Varnish or Squid or some sort, of, some sort of dedicated proxy for handling caching is what you want. You can achieve caching, like I said, with Symfony manually if you want to. You can configure caching. You can configure browser caching. But this is where you get really, really good speed gains. And what it does is it sits between the client and the server and it intercepts requests and responses and it does things to them. That's why it's a proxy. Um, and the key thing for this is it can share cached responses between multiple clients. Um, I'll come on to that in a second. And we also used it because it can perform load balancing and routing. And these, we, these were two, two things we knew we were going to need. Um, so this is what it used to look like without Varnish. We have a bunch of clients. We have a bunch of servers. And when clients were making requests to our servers, they'd be hitting, they'd be hitting the servers directly. Um, I think we had some sort of load balancing in place, so maybe we were doing round robin, so it would iterate through servers. We try not to, do, we try not to, to distribute load across them as best we could. But there's nothing stopping a client from bombarding a server, essentially, um, and for a server from getting overloaded. Um, and even if we had, say, tried to do a quick fix, implemented some, implemented some caching, and said, OK, don't come back to me for a day. This, is, you know, this resource is fine. Um, when, that, when that day's over, though, that same thing's going to happen again. Users are free to, to hit Control r and just, you know, just hit the website again, ignore cache, and just come straight back to you. Um, it was never going to be a proper, proper scalable solution doing it that way. With Varnish, however, you get this approach. And that's where, rather than talking directly to the servers, you put Varnish in the middle. Clients are coming along and talking to Varnish instead. And if three users were to come along for the same request, so just to illustrate this, if, all, if three servers came along trying to hit the home page of that URL, the first, the first client, their request would be taken and sent through to the back end. Varnish would hold the other two clients there in a sort of like a holding pen until that response came back. And then when it did, it would pass it on to all three of them. So one request goes to the back end. The back end responds with a, with a, with a, with a uh, response with a time delay of one day. Varnish holds that and knows it can keep it for a day. Then it sends it on to the other clients. 
Um, the way this scales then is if you throw more clients at this. So a bunch of other clients come along and talk to Varnish. Varnish doesn't need to go anywhere near your servers anymore. It can just get their responses and send it straight back to the clients. And your servers are under no load whatsoever. Um, that's, that's, that's where the key benefit comes in. Varnish is keeping all this in memory. It's really quick. We're not, we're not touching the, the file system. Um, we implement this. This is all done in EC2. So we have a couple of Varnish servers sitting in front of our web boxes. Um, um, we just give them a bunch of memory to work with, and it holds the responses. Uh, and the load in our boxes dropped enormously. The web server boxes are doing practically nothing. Once we had a populated cache, that was the end of it. Um, there are a couple of things to bear in mind. Uh, first of all, uh, it's important to working with caching is potentially a, a tricky thing. There's a lot of good information on the simply, in the simply documentation about how you go about doing this, and I won't try and repeat it all because it's something you need to read through, really. Um, but first of all, you need to handle uh, sort of cache configuration, so how long it's going to be cached for, um, whether, it, whether it can be expired or not, um, whether it's private, or, or, uh, and which means it can't, whether the response is private and can't be cached, or public, and it can be cached. Um, that's sort of the half of it, but the, the tricky bit is the, sort of the invalidation of caching. That's where it gets really hard. Um, how do you tell Varnish that a resource is no longer cacheable, that it should give the user fresh content? Um, and there's a few different ways you can do this. You can, um, when Varnish uh, checks with the back end to make sure a cache, uh, a cache resource is still fresh, you can perform some lookups in the database, like check last modified time to see if it's still valid or not, and you can tell Varnish, actually, no, it's out of date now, you need to, you, I need to give you a new one, here it is. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the general way that most people do it. Um, we didn't do that because we were under a lot of time pressure, um, and it would have taken a lot. Uh, it taken a long time for us to implement that the level of that level of caching at the level that we needed it to be robust enough for us to be confident in it. So we did something that actually tells you not to do in the simply documentation, and that's we manually purge varnish ourselves. So we have some doctrine listeners in the background. Whenever entities are modified, um, the listeners fire, and uh, we we send uh, requests to. Um, to uh, memcache and to varnish to flesh up the cache resources. It's not really an ideal solution, and it's something we're going to try and phase out over time. Um, we'll probably implement some sort of key-based caching approach so that our cache resources can manually sort of uh, dictate what they, what they depend on. Um, there's a really good article by, um, oh, I've forgotten his name, the guy who uh, wrote Rails, DDH or DHH, I think it is, um, on key-based caching, which is really interesting. Uh, Check that out if you're interested in how to get really good caching solutions. Um, but we're looking to move towards that in the future. But this approach works for us at the moment. We just sort of manually purge the cache when, when things get stale. And then the next time a request comes to Varnish, it knows it has to go back to the back end and get a new response. Um, taking that a step further, we then looked at doing ESI caching, um, which is really relevant to us because we're working with a CMS um, with made up of loads of small blocks on the page. Um, all the blocks are configured individually, so it, it lends itself well to ESI caching. ESI stands for Edge Side Includes. Uh, if you're not aware of what ESI is, it's, it identifies, it's a custom protocol written by Akamai, uh, I think late 90s, it identifies blocks on, on the page which, um, which are dynamic, which uh, need to be sort of managed individually and can, uh, can exist separate to the actual page they're displayed on. So, when you implement ESI caching, blocks are now independent of the main response, so you can actually make a, re make a request just for a small element of the page. Um, these, re these, these responses can then be cached and expired individually, which gives you great flexibility over how dynamic your, your overall page is. Um, and depending on whether you want blocks to be cached or not, you can identify them as being public, which means that they can be cached and then available to all users, or private, and they shouldn't be cached because they, they contain some data that only the, only the user that requested that uh, response can see, for example, some personal details. It, it maybe contains the username or something. And the trick is to sort of identify which blocks are which. Um, try and get as many blocks as public as you can so they can be available to all users, which reduces the amount of load you can have to deal with. Um, and if you have to do some private caching, try and keep it, try and keep it uh, simple. So this is what your page ends up looking like. You've got a bunch of blocks on there. Everything in the blue sort of border is an ESI cached. Uh, element, and then you can give different time to lives for different parts of the page. So uh, the Twitter block in the bottom right hand corner, because that changes much more often, we maybe cache that for five minutes. Uh, the, the carousel at the top, content that very rarely changes, we might cache that for five days. 
we know then that nobody's potentially in all likelihood going to come back to request that resource for five days. And on the home page, for example, if something gets a hell of a lot of traffic, that, that makes a massive difference. We're, it means the process that we have to do is probably just that Twitter block every five minutes, which is much, much, uh, which involves much less CPU and much less memory than generating the entire page does. When things get validated, like for example, if we change those images, or if we change the movie that's displayed in the left there, uh, or this career search here, um, which uses the API we built to, to pull down um, a bunch of jobs, uh, it might surprise you to find out that not all the jobs available in Wales are for sheep farming. There are a bunch of other ones as well. Um, this happens, so the individual blocks get validated, um, but the rest of the blocks, which are still cacheable, go on as normal. So even when some things have changed, we're still only asking for small, dis discrete versions of the page, which are relatively, um, relatively small to process. The only problem, the, the biggest problem, which I found with using Varnish in ESI requests is that if all these things go in one go, like there's a massive sort of change to the system which invalidates everything, like if for some reason we have to clear the entire cache, then rather than dealing with one request to generate this page, we're instead dealing with 14, which is actually ends up being much worse than if we just stuck with just the single response in the first place. So that's something to be aware of is when you get a really bad cache invalidation, your page is kind of being slower than, than, they, than they would have before. So carousel block caching is really straightforward. It's the same for all users. We don't personalize it in the slightest. The code for that is dead simple um, in your Symfony uh, controller action. You create your response. You set a max age of one minute on it. And you set it as public, which means it can be cached for all users. And you render the response as normal. Varnish, no, Varnish talks to HTTP exactly the same way as the browser does. It sees that information, caches it, and that's fine. Um, Something like the login button is potentially a lot more tricky to do. So I'll just give you an example of how you do a more complex sort of caching. This is probably some of the more complex stuff that we do, and we've ended up having to do. So we wanted to cache the login button um, because it has two different states. When the user's logged in, obviously it needs to say logged out. When the user's logged out, it needs to say logged in. This is a pretty trivial example, but it illustrates nicely the point of how you would go about doing something like this. You can use the same approach I'm going to show you for doing things like caching based on the locale the user's got or based on some arbitrary data in their cookie or something like that. Um, so we're going to use varying to store two different versions of the cache, one for logged in users, one for logged out users. Um, we'll use cookies to provide the information to Varnish, but we don't want to vary on the cookie because if you do that, you vary on everything in the cookie and you end up with a different cache for every single permutation of each cookie, which means you can absolutely like, load Varnish with so much information that your cache is just your memory is used up instantly. You want to try and keep your caching as small and discrete as possible. Um, so the index action here, uh, similar to last time, except this time we're going to vary on a header uh, called logged in. So we're going to send a header back to, to indicate whether the user's logged in or not. Uh, and as before, we just render the response. We have a, a listener here, a kernel listener, uh, which has been added to Symphony 2. And that checks to see, it checks the security context to see if the user is authenticated or not. And then it sets that a header on the response accordingly. So if they're logged in, they've now got a header sent back to the, to the browser and to Varnish, illustrating the user's logged in. We've also got a second listener. This can actually go in the same listener, but I broke it up just so it's sort of easier to see on the page, on the, on the, on the, on the screen. Um, we're also setting a cookie, which with the same name as the, it doesn't have to be the same name, just chosen the same name here. Uh, and the cookie has got the same value as the header. So we've got a header going back and we've got a cookie value going back, um, illustrating the user is logged in or not. And then again, we set that, uh, we set that cookie on the header, on the response. Um, so, okay, I've got a missing slide there. Don't know why. Actually, it's a, it's a duplicate, no, no problem. So, um, now, Varnish cache keys are hashed on the URL, um, which breaks down to the host, the path, uh, and any varied data you provide in your response. So um, what happens is we want to try to keep that as discrete as possible because we don't, we don't want to end up caching too much stuff. So we need to extract that logged in value from the cookie and then, and then and use it in a clever way. So what we do is we have some, uh, this is some Varnish configuration. Varnish uses a, a scripting logic called VCL. To, to manage this, we check the cookie to see this is, this is the, re the request coming in from the user. So if they make a request then um, with a cookie that illustrates they're logged in, we check to see if the cookie has the logged in true value. And if it does, then we add a header to the request coming in before it gets processed to illustrate that they're logged in. 
So Varnish now thinks that there's a header with a logged in value on it, and that allows us to hash the exact same hash that we sent out the last time. So it, may, it allows us to, to match the hash that we originally sent out, um, which, which you know, is, is the way that we sort of fake being able to send headers from the client to ourselves and gives us the ability to cache private responses, which are responses that would usually be private like this. So uh, Varnish also does routing. It can direct requests to given backends. It can do round robin, like I said earlier. Um, but the more complex logic can also be done by VCL. And a, a side benefit of this is it means we didn't need any load balances from EC2 whatsoever. We can do it all in Varnish ourselves. So a client comes along to Varnish. Varnish checks the request. If it matches a certain type of, of URL, it goes to, oops, it goes to uh, the old applications. If it matches the new type, it goes to the new applications. And this is how we get the user to never know where they're going, whether they go into the old stack or the new stack. So we've got two backends. This is actually done with the cron, um, because these two uh, IP addresses are dynamic. We generate this dynamically with a cron. Um, but we have a legacy applications backend, a new applications backend. Um, and then we have a, some, uh, a little uh, regex match in the varnish configuration, which checks the URLs coming in. If the, if the regex matches the old request format, uh, which is specific to the old CMS, we send them off to the legacy applications backend, which knows how to deal with that sort of request. If the request URL matches the new format, we send them off to the new applications, Symfony 2 stack. Quite straightforward. So that's how it looks now. Client comes in, Varnish directs the applications, and we've got our new, we've got our SSO and API stacks and data stores sitting in the middle. Substantially less hardware than on the new side than on the other side. In July 2012, we had this with 10 concurrent users, 20 seconds average to get through that. In July 2013, the same, exact same thing, we're down to four seconds to do that. So it's a massive, massive gain in terms of speed and performance. It's actually a 560% increase, which the client was very happy with, with no loss of functionality or downtime because it was completely transparent. We had, um, we had the equivalent of Apache um, redirect maps in the middle in Varnish. So um, we could turn this stuff on and off as we wanted to. When we, want, we were happy that, a, we were happy that a, a new phase of the, the new stack worked well, we could just take the redirects away and let the users flow to the new system. So it was, it was completely uh, effortless to put live. There was no big bang launch. We just phased in the new stuff as we wanted to. Um, we used substantially less hardware than before. We're using, I think, three or four servers now to manage the website as opposed to the, you know, the 30 I'll be using at high peak before. It's a more complex environment. It's harder to deploy. But thankfully, I'm not a sysadmin, so I don't care about that. That's their problem. <laughs> um, and just to prove that uh, it went down well in Wales, this is the road into Swansea. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but surely. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Any questions, I'd be glad to take them. <laughs> no? You all want food, don't you? That's the problem. Yeah. One? Yes, yeah, there's a few options. Um, JavaScript is one, and we in fact had to use JavaScript in some cases. One of, the, one of the things that we found when you put Varnish in front of something is some of the things we go to implement, you, which we were used to doing in Symfony 2, like using an event, uh, an event listener to, to, to do some actions when a page runs, you can't rely on because you can't ever guarantee that the, the page is going to be hit, the server is actually going to be hit, and it's going to do any work. So we used a lot more JavaScript than we thought we would because we have to know. Um, we have to now assume that we're not always going to use the PHP side. Um, so a lot of the blocks are actually rendered with JavaScript. A lot of the movies that uh, they get displayed are actually done through JavaScript calls to, to the back end to get the data for them. Because we've got this API now sitting in the middle, we were able to use a JavaScript client for that as well, potentially, to, to get some data and display that. So at the moment, we're not using as much as we'd like. As we'd like. And in fact, we're probably use, we're using ESI more than we'd like to. Um, there are a lot of blocks that they don't really need ESI. They can be, they can be rendered along with the main page body. Um, and I think what we end up with is a hybrid where some blocks at ESI, the, the more complex ones, are more difficult to process. And we we'll use some JavaScript for some of the more like media-based blocks, maybe, uh, and anything that we can get from the API. And then the rest of them will be served through ESI then. But it's, it's definitely a valid point. Um, so does the main page come through, depending on, how is the main page rendered? So the main page is rendered using Symfony. Um, and then it'll come back to Varnish with a bunch of, um, Symfony automatically inserts some, uh, some custom tags in the body of the HTML, which are Akamai, Akamai standard, uh, and that indicates that ESI, ESI blocks. Yeah. Um, so that just gets, uh, it's cached, like anything else, it's cached based on the URL, um, and any vary headers, that, uh, any vary data you might give the response, 
just cache in the same way. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's easier to cache the main page because it, if you've stripped all the dynamic stuff out a bit and put it in ESI requests, the page is essentially a header and a footer and a, and a block in the middle. So the page can probably be cached indefinitely, really, because it's the same for pretty much every user.